Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Jane Root. She is the founder and CEO of Newtopia, the former president of Discovery Channel Networks, and the former controller of BBC Two, the creator of the 12-part Emmy Award-winning series, America, The Story of Us. She's executive producer of the new National Geographic channel, or Nat Geo show, The 2000s, A New Reality. And we're going to examine technology, the character of the decade of the 2000s, economics and all the economic and financial impact. And it should be a very interesting conversation. Jane, welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Great to be here. Give us a sense of geography. Where are you located? I'm located in Washington, D.C. these days. Although you can tell me from my voice, I didn't originally come from here. Um, you know, Sound like you might be a Brit. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You've got that. That's my favorite accent in all the world. I think uh, many people share that. <laughs> so good stuff. Well, gosh, you know, it was a fascinating decade, the first 10 years of our new century here. What things really marked that decade? Of course, you know, we had 9-11 that changed the whole world. The amazing resurgence of Apple and, and you know, the iPhone changed the world and so many things. Um, take it where you want. I mean, uh, let's review. Well, you know, it was interesting. We'd made a series from National Geographic on the 80s and one on the 90s. And then they said, well, shall we do the 2000s? And quite honestly, we thought, isn't it too soon? We always talk about our shows as being kind of the first draft of history. Something edges over between the world we're living in and becoming a world you can talk about as history. I thought we were like, wow, that's really soon. But actually, once we started to look at it, we were like, yeah, well, it's right on the cusp of being the world we live now. And also the way that history is a strange place. History is a, another time. And there's a lot of things when you go back and you look at the beginning of the decade and you think, wow, we really were living in a different time. You, you think of the way that the phrase hanging Chad became part of <laughs> That's true, yeah. kind of, you know, daily life and the whole saga around that election and also a sense that like you know the world was at peace there was not that much going on it was economy was booming and you know you had George Bush a president who I think was recording at that point less days in an actual White House than any other present president in recent times you know there's a lot of golf going on and you know it was kind of like there was the summer of the shark when in fact fewer people were bitten by sharks than the year before but it felt like that was a big thing to get scared about. So every decade has a flavor, you know. It, it seems like you can really say that 50s, the 60s, every decade has a flavor. So, you know, before we dive too deeply into the 2000s, you did the 80s and the 90s. How would you just sort of sum those up? Like, what was the flavor of each of those? And then what was the flavor of the 2000s? Well, the 80s was really the point when the world we live in right now was created, I think. It was a combination of 60s and 70s kind of hippiedom and idealism kind of got monetizable, if you like. It hit that business connected up with culture in a way to create a huge growth in technology and everything from the rise of the gym to the creation of the ATM to the world getting faster, the beginning of our obsession with telephones. It suddenly became the world that we now live in. So many things we take for granted were created in the 80s. The thing that distinguished the 90s, I think, well, I think James Carville, who worked for Bill Clinton, said it very well. He said, well, you know, what was it you didn't like? Was it the peace or the prosperity? 
You know, this amazing 10 years between the end of the Cold War with the coming down of the Berlin Wall <laughs> and 9-11, where the economy was through the roof. It, pretty much everybody in America's standard of living rose by a huge amount. I got to say, that's fascinating that you're saying that because James Carville, I can't believe he said something that bright. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> what is it you didn't like, the peace or the prosperity? So many people criticize the 80s. You know, I, I remember Bryant Gumbel when he was on the air saying the greedy excesses of the Reagan era. That's surprising. James Carville, he, he's not a Reagan fan. The, the 80s was he a was pretty talking good about the 90s, but oh, he, the was, 90s. he was okay. kind of he was he, the 90s. I think is the point. If 80s was an era of innovation, 90s was the point when really the peace dividend from the end of the Cold War kind of hit ordinary people's lives and mm, okay. ordinary life. Just there was no deficit. There was no foreign wars pretty much anywhere. There was a few civil wars, but you know, nothing on the scale of what we'd seen in previous decades. And so, you know, a lot of time in, quite honestly, in the 90s, people, when not much was going on, people were able to get really obsessed about the president's affair with his intern and things like that, which actually, in a dire time, would have, have not felt like they were big news. You kind of have something the same happening at the beginning of the 2000s, where Gary Condit, the senator, who's... Boy, 9-11 was his best friend, wasn't it? He just, yeah, he just fell from the news on 9-11, didn't he? Absolutely. He was, couldn't move on the news until 9-11, and then it was over. And that was Gary, maybe the listeners don't remember, Chandra Levy, the intern that disappeared. and She was murdered. I think they caught the perpetrator, right? Yeah, she was murdered. She was found in Rock Creek National Park. And and every thought, but he thought Gary Conn had did it. But you Yeah, know, and a serial killer who had killed other women, yeah, well. confessed, and then later died in prison. So it, it clearly was nothing to do with him. Yeah. But, you know, the whole the sexy senator and his intern story spiraled out of control across the media. We interview in our show, we interview him, uh, it's something that was going on with sharks. We interview a, a marine biologist who said that he was, he did no laboratory work for three months because he was on the phone all day and on TV. He was doing 35 interviews. He today. wasn't doing research. He was just doing interviews. He wasn't yeah. doing research. He had the summer off and he just said, like, I'm just going to do whatever press they want me to do, I'm just going to do. And so he was on the, on the news shows all the time. And then he said, then there was a certain day in September when his phone never rang again for 10 years until us. <laughs> no one had asked him about the summer of the shark. And so, you know, it's just that sense that when there's not a huge amount going on, those kind of media flurries fill the gap, fill up the minutes of airtime when nothing else is going on. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so what about, you know, some of the really important things that happened in the 2000s? I mean, you know, of course, 9-11, the economy doing its thing all over the place, really. Uh, technology, it, it seems like technology really, like you said, the stuff that happened in the 60s and 70s became monetizable in the 80s. That's an interesting way that you phrase that. And it seems like a lot of the technology from the 80s and the 90s became really accessible and usable to the individual in the 2000s. And I, I'd say Apple was the huge change with the iPhone. The Apple was a huge change, but before Apple was Napster. Mm. Oh, um, yeah, good point. Yeah, Napster. You know, yeah. So, so really Napster, Napster begat the iPod. And the idea that really... Which Sean Fanning started at Napster that really the idea that sharing music was a really important thing as much as owning it. That was a really different way of looking at it. The idea that singles were more important than albums and that you didn't have to own something forever. You just wanted to own a song and that you wanted to have it portable. The portable music had been there since the Walkman, but Napster took it to a new level. That The laptop that increasingly everybody had with them no iphones yet but that actually you wanted you know you wanted to pass music on and sean fanning started napster it was a kind of fun sort of crazy internet thing but then after you know it was steve jobs who really bet everything at apple on the idea that we would want to take music with us 
and that we would want to own it in that new kind of way. I mean, one of the really phenomenal business stories, I think, about that time is the fact that it was a computer company at that point who figured it out, how to turn Napster, what Napster had done, into a new industry. It's one of those, like, business school kind of cases where, the, you know, the fact that the people who had made their business selling music for, what, 100 years, 50 years? All they thought they had to do was take Napster to court and get a ruling against them, right. and it would all go away. Sure, yeah. How wrong they were. Yeah, right, right. It really was. What about the economics of the 2000s? What about the financial side? I think that it was a period, taking on from what had done in the 90s, where you see an enormous weakening of restrictions. You, you actually see cultures emerging where all of the kind of go for it, don't hold back, money, money, money kind of feeling that had been emerging in the 80s and 90s really at some point kind of hit the buffers. I mean, I think the Enron story, some stories that are just like comedy, you know, they're comedy versions of something really big and serious going on. The big serious thing that was going on was the rise of financial instruments that were so complex that you had to be right deep inside a company to understand it and a lessening of regulation and of companies getting really, really, really involved in the supply of utilities, not as like local small companies supplying the area, but huge financial companies playing with places like California's electricity supply. What happens with Enron is where it really starts to go crazy is where people are just making stuff up you know, the shell companies with the names of crazy Star Wars characters. People, when the, the decline... You're talking about happen, Enron there, right? With yeah, the, Enron. With the, with the SPVs, the special purpose vehicles, these fake shell yeah. companies, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Things that no one could quite believe that they were doing, but they did. Towards the end, when the bankruptcy was becoming really apparent, the fact that they had trading floors when no one was doing any trading... They just had people in there pretending to talk to each other on the phone so to disguise what was really happening. That you had computers that weren't even wired up properly to the systems. It's just crazy stuff. And then Sharon Watkins, who I think is a real hero, we interview her in the show, who was a woman who really was the major whistleblower, who just said, this is crazy, this has all got to stop. Took her a long while to get listened to, but when she did, she was really the person who started to blow the whole thing up. Very interesting. So what else would you say about the 2000s? What else do you want people to know? I mean, it was also an amazing time in terms of the technology and in, in biotech and the genome. And, uh, you know, it just strikes me as th we're living in a really amazing time. It seems like we're on the verge of so many incredible technological breakthroughs as if we haven't had enough already, but a lot more to come. I think that there's one of the things that's crazy about this is the speed of change. You know, that things are happening so fast. If you think of the fact that on 9-11, you know, just after the beginning of the decade, no one had a camera in the phone, no one had a smartphone. You know, YouTube hadn't been created. GPS was just starting to creep its way into trucks and things like that. But, you know, cars didn't have GPS. And now those things that we just so take for granted... I think that that sense of just speed of change going on is really, you know, really phenomenal. And that's something which, you know, wow, what a time we're living in where those things happen in that kind of way. We are really living in an incredible time. What do you attribute that to? I mean, like, you know, looking back at the 2000s, what really brought about this sort of seeming convergence of amazing technologies? I mean, it's probably the network effect largely from the internet and, and just people being able to share ideas so seamlessly. And of course, commerce became seamless, you know, this frictionless, instantaneous global commerce that really just by about the time of the dot-com bubble, which, by the way, we didn't mention, but that happened in the 2000s, of yep. course. Really, that laid a lot of the groundwork for what we have now and, and really an incredible expansion during that decade, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've also got the world becoming more global. You know, I think that the sense that things don't just, whether it's movies 
all being released on the same day or whether it's things like the tsunami, which, you know, that's a good case study in how global news became something that we all experienced really directly. Uh, But also people were there filming it. They were filming it on their own camera phones. And that's why the kind of enormity of what that was kind of made it into all of our lives and so, you know, became that huge incident in, in a way that it just wouldn't have in a previous time. So it's globalization, it's technology, it's networking, it's all to- us talking to each other all the time in a way that it's just really, really different. You really do see, feel that all these different trends are coming together. I think that's an important thing. It, it is really amazing what you can do when you connect all these minds yeah. and people can collaborate easy. And if you look at the world now of cloud computing, I mean, the way it's just so cheap to start a business and it's so easy to collaborate with people all around the world and manage projects. And it's really amazing. I mean, it yeah. really is. I mean, in our show, we have a lot of people who you normally think of being incredibly different you know, and not on the same side at all from people like, um, well, we have O'Reilly and Dick Cheney, but we also have Sharon Osbourne. We also have Michael Moore. And there's a sense that they're all kind of coming together on our show. The only thing that they agree about in any way about the world was a sense that the 2000s is a really fascinating puzzle to get together on. It's a puzzle to kind of understand and something that you know is really kind of, it's fascinating to unlock these different threads of how different things came together. Yeah, it really is. Wow. What else do you want people to know? Maybe a question I haven't asked you or just anything you want to share. I do think there's some fun things that we find out, some just extraordinary facts. I always like that kind of sense of like, what are things that people just didn't know? More people watched the final episode of the first series of Survivor than voted for George Bush the first time around. That was something I really didn't know. So that you have that, so you have that, you have the sense of TV and movies kind of coming into their own in a really surprising way. I think you have a sense of just different threads coming together in the world, things that we all remember and connect together. So I think that that's, you know, that, that's the big thing I'd say about our show. Yeah. And it's, you know, one of the things that we also talk a lot about, you said, what are we aiming for? We talk a lot about in our company about kind of clever pleasure. We're aiming for it to be kind of enjoyable and kind of provoking and thought provoking. That's our aim. Very interesting. Very interesting. Give out your website. Tell people where they can find out more. Utopia.com. N-U-T-O-P-I-A. And that's where you can find lots of clips of the show. So, Jane, how and where can people see the show? You can see the show. It'll be all over YouTube. It'll be on Nat Geo's site. And you can also see it on our site, which is utopia.com. Excellent. Jane Root, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. That was fascinating questions. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.